okay? So just be aware of that. So what we're going to do today, this is, I just threw this up because we did see some of this yesterday. I know with yesterday's group we had uh, buckhorn plantain. These are species you'll need to know, very important species, plantago major, broadleaf plantain, okay? Um, there is, just so you know, so the, these are good, in, they're major turf weeds, generally speaking, okay? They're turf grass weed problems. Um, narrow leaf or bu buckhorn plantain, very long, narrow leaves, okay? Lanceolate, it's also, that's why it's called lanceolate, which means long, okay? Um, good indicators of compact soils. I mean, if you kind of look out on campus, you know when you guys are cutting through shortcuts through the lawns and these different buildings, Comstock, even here when you come to Bradfield, now they put this mulch down. But if you look around where people walk a lot, you'll often see this species. It's just a rosette. These are perennials, okay? They're reproduced mostly by seed, but they're, they're there. The same plant is there year after year. And when you mow, particularly for them plantago, they're low to the ground. That you, unless you're going to get right over it and scalp your turf, they're going to be there, and they're happy, okay? But when I see these species, that tells me, hmm, probably fairly compact type soils, okay? So just... This will help you. Now, the one thing that's kind of interesting is that there is, these are both non-native. They're of European okay, origin. We do have a native species that I want you to kind of take a look at, because most people say, oh, that's broadleaf plantain, plantago major. But there's actually a native plantago called plantago rugelli. And the reason it's called rugelli, rugelli, you know, think about red, the red color. Look at the stem. Okay? It's got that red tint. The major will not have that. Okay, that's one of the characteristics. So it's kind of neat. You're looking at it. I mean, it's for control and being a pest, it's the same thing. It's, so it's native. But it is actually a different species. And look for the, this is the, the, one of the good characteristics. You can also look at the seed heads under a microscope, but most of you are not going to be sitting there under a microscope. But if you notice this red tinging here on the, on the leaves, okay, that's Plantago rugelli. It's not, it's the native species. And so folks that are interested in comparing native, non-native species often work with this. So native to North America when I'm talking native here, okay? So just a little, so when you're out there in the lawn, take a look if you've got the native, and often they co-occur, they're together, okay? But they're both can be problematic. Certainly the more common is the plant, the imported one, the exotic species that have been here, okay? Uh, this is curly dock, Rumex crispus, polygonaceae. And curly dock, the leaves are kind of wavy, long and narrow, because we also have a broadleaf dock, Rumex obtusifolius, okay? That's got much broader leaves, and you'll see, you've seen some of that in the garden. Again, I'm just starting, I like to throw in a few of these each class just to get you thinking. Um, these are the seeds, a lot of you in the wintertime, even in the snow, you can look at your fields and you see this red thing sticking out, you know, this red... And as you know, you've got one of the, the burdocks, uh, the burdocks, one of the, uh, the docks, okay? And this is what the, the seeds, they have this papery bract, that's the seed in there. These things are just full of seeds. And I'll, I'll be able to tell you that you can, and, and this can happen on the weed ID exam. What I'll do is I'll just give you the seed heads. I'll just give you this part without the whole plant, and I'll ask you, based on the seeds, Okay, what, which of the two species it, is this? Is it broadleaf dock or curly dock? And the way you tell is that broadleaf dock, okay, the seed heads, and, and I mean the, the seed, the fruit does not have any spines or any teeth, okay? Whereas the, the broadleaf dock, you notice it here, and you'll see it much better when you have it in your hands. You will see that the papery bracts have teeth or margins. So if it has margins or teeth, that's broadleaf dock. And we'll go over this, but just... Kind of keep that, oh, okay, there's something about the seed. And on the exam, believe me, you want to know that. You want to have them in front of you because you know you're going to get it. And it's not a surprise. You will get it on the exam. There's no tricks here. I want you to show me that you know this stuff. So this would be the broadleaf dock, Rumex obtisifolius, okay? This would be the curly dock, that plant that we just showed you before, long, narrow leaves. The broadleaf dock has very much larger, okay, leaves, almost like rhubarb type. And, and we'll, we'll cover that in class. Okay, so this is common lamb's quarters. It's a rotten picture. Don't, not going to, there's the seeds, by the way. And there's lots of seeds we saw yesterday. Okay, so classification. What I'd like to, we can classify weeds in many different ways, okay? So these are some of the ways, but can you tell me what they're referring to? I mean, this, I think, is kind of self-explanatory. And remember, you know, when we were in the weeds garden, I was always telling you, oh, 
Okay, this is such and such a plant. It's an annual, summer annual, winter annual. It's a perennial. It's a biennial. Very, very important that you know not only what the plant is, scientific common name, scientific common name, the family it's in, but also its habit, its life cycle. Is this thing an annual? Should we worry about it from year to year, or is it just produce seeds? And if we can cut down on seeds, we should be okay. Or no, this is a perennial, man. You go in and you cultivate, and you got rhizomes. You chop them up into smaller pieces. It's going to be there next year and the year after, so be careful. Okay? But what would be the other classification of weeds? I mean, you have the, the, the big information. What does ease of control mean? What kind of classification is ease of control? Can you, can you classify weeds as being those weeds are easy to control, those are really hard to control, okay? Rob? Right. Field bind weeds or right. Okay. Steve. There are some weeds that have their biomass below ground and others that have it above, so if you're trying to go from That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I wanted to say. I mean, there's nothing wrong. When I work with growers, the growers and, and you know, whether it's turf people, again, when I, I use growers in a very general term because I work with, you know, natural area managers, turf folks, superintendents, you know, kind of the whole gamut. But just when, so when I say growers, don't feel like I'm maybe missing some of you, but I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, your, the, the, per, the folks you work with. They often, in their spe specific areas, regions, and stuff, do have in their minds that this is a fairly easy plant to control with maybe available chemicals or even some of the organic growers. Yeah, good cultivation will do it versus some other ones. It is not a classification I really like because, again, it is subject, depends who you talk to. Uh, you know, velvet leaf, maybe to a, you know, a conventional grower. Yeah, I've got some good, you know, some good herbicides that'll do the job on it. You know, I've got some uh, permit, a halosulfuron, it'll knock it right off. But to an organic grower, man, this is major league, or, or if you have uh, atrazine resistant lamb squatters, that's a problem, okay? So it's a system I don't like to use too, too much, but just recognize that especially if you're working in extension or with growers or other stakeholders, they might, they might say, oh, this is a real hard one to control. Tough. Because like, you ask most people, and I can probably ask some of you, you know, what are some weeds that are really tough to control in your own? farms or systems that you're working in, and I'm sure you can name them. Say, so, oh yeah, Japanese knotweed, if I'm working, you know, in natural areas, that's one, garlic, mustard, swallowwort, and then in terms of weeds, you know, Johnson grass, wire stem muley, or, you know, can be tough. So, uh, that's a system. So, uh, I'm going to focus less on the ease of control, but more on the botanical life cycle. Just make sure you all get that, you know, you understand what we mean. A little bit on physiology. C3, C4 can plants. We tried to touch upon that a little bit. I just want to, you know, in a very, very simple way. Uh, and also uh, a little bit of ecology on, on strategies that these plants, plants can be classified according to the kind of strategies they use. And weeds are really particular. They fit in nicely, at least some of them, in one of these classifications. Now, some of you have probably never heard of this if you haven't taken kind of a basic ecology course, but some might have. And, and I'll say more about John Harper's model and it's not too complicated. I'm going to keep it you know, simple, but just be aware of that. And a fellow named Philip Grime, CSR strategist. And I'll tell you what, who's ever heard of CSR theory or strategy? It's usually the way it is. You may be one person. Not a problem. I'll cover that. Okay? We'll go over that. Okay? Uh, the one thing that you can classify uh, weeds is also on habitat. These are wetland weeds, aquatics. Uh, you know, forest area weeds, turf weeds, you can definitely do that. And some of the species occur in more than one area. We have weeds that occur along roadsides that typically you wouldn't see elsewhere. They just, they need to be in these disturbed areas. We have others that are in no-till, but we wouldn't see them elsewhere. So uh, that is often used, okay? Um, you know, these tend to be in corn or in annual cropping systems. So just recognize that we'll say some of that too. Okay, and that ease of control we talked about, it's not something I want to, I want to use too, too much, but just be aware that it's out there. Now we get into more 
the botanical classification. I think it's going to be important for you to, to be aware of this. And I have additional images in your handouts that I'm not going to show you here as to, you know, why we call something a dicot versus a monocot, a grass. And it just has to do with, with how many cotyledons are there. But uh, most of our weeds, okay, are in the angiosperm, okay? They're except things like horsetail, okay? that are, you know, a little more primitive, okay? And uh, we'll, be, we'll see some equisetum, okay? These are the horsetails, really bad. They can be problematic. We have more than one species, but this, our vents is the major um, agronomic weed. How many of you on your farms, for those of you who are from farm or at least in other systems, have you actually had some horsetail on your fields? Anybody? That's good, because you get this plant. I've been, I worked with some of the, some soybean growers, if this thing gets into your fields, it's bad news. It's got rhizomes. It does not reproduce by seed. Does anybody know how, well, how this plant reproduces? It's got rhizomes, yes, but what else does it do? Anybody? It's really primitive. It's primitive. Spores. It's almost like a fungus. It's got this green. You, early in the spring, the first thing you see coming out of your mulch or from last year's stubble are these what look like, you know, uh, I mean, we call them, they're, it's the reproductive structures. They're like, you would almost think they're little mushrooms sticking out of the ground. They're brown, and I'll be able to show you these. And those produce spores, and the spores can travel a long ways, okay? You don't want this plant. It usually occurs in wet areas of the fields. So if it's in ditches, it easily moves. And I've had growers move it with, with tillage equipment throughout the whole field when they had a little patch there, and then it's hard to control. We don't have very good herbicides for this. And the reason is, do you guys know what this plant looks like? And it just looks like basically a stem with these branches. It, what are actual leaves, you know, the leaves have been, you know, are, you know, been reduced, and there's, you know, almost scales. And so you try to put Roundup or one of these herbicides that needs to get into the plant, what we call a systemic herbicide, there's just no place to enter because it's so thin, okay? So it's a real problem. We, one herbicide that we've used in the past that's worked is something called uh, MCPA, but... It's not, it's not ideal. Anyway, the, just to tell you, this is one I, I don't want you to be worrying about. But most of our, so most of the, our, our weeds are in the angiosperms, and they're either divided into monocots or dicots. The monocots are the grasses. And they're monocots because they just have one cotyledon, okay? What we call your, the seed, they're a corn seed, and it's just one. Whereas if you think about a bean, a soybean or a snapping, what happens? You've got the first thing that comes out of the ground and usually arches, are the cotyledons, and you have images in there that open up, okay? And then you've got the true, you know, the first leaf com coming through. So you have the radical, which is, um, you know, basically the precursor of roots, first thing that comes out of a, you know, germinating seed in general, and then you've got, you know, you've got the cotyledons. And what happens to the cotyledons over time, These, you know, in your beans and stuff? Do they remain there? They're gone. What, hap what, what value do they have for the plant? Why do you have these two structures? In there initially, they're going to supply food and energy to the plant, the seedling, the germling as it's growing before the plant can actually put up the you know, photosynthetic apparatus, the leaves, that then it can start. And that's when they drop off. Okay? So that's in part how, you know, why we come. So the dicots are the, what we call the broadleaf, broadleaf plants. Okay? Ragweed, velvet leaf, lamb's quarters, pigweeds, whereas the monocots are okay, the grasses. And we'll see that next week in lab. We're going to be working on the monocots. The reason this becomes important is because sometimes you will see that we will say, oh, this herbicide is controls monocots, or broadly, oh, it's a broadleaf herbicide, okay? Or it's, you know, grass or graminicide is another term. So being aware, you know, most of you know that this tends to be a grass. This is not a grass. The only one that can mix up some folks is yellow nut sedge, which is one of our common weeds, but it's got a triangular stem. It's a sedge, Okay? And we'll, we'll go over that next week. But just, okay, so the, the monocots are the poaceae, and so these are the other species, except the cyperaceae, tend to be the, the, the key broadleaf families, the, the uh, solanaceous species, the nightshades, okay, uh, the smartweeds and the pigweeds, okay. So typically what we have is the genus Echinocloa, Cruz Galli, okay, this is barnyard grass, okay, so this is what I would expect you. If I show you a barnyard grass, I'd expect you to write, give me the scientific name, okay? The common name, what family it's in. In this case, it would be the Poaceae. And then you'd have to tell me, is this an annual, biannual, perennial? In this case, this is an annual. So it survives one growing season, and 
spe the species makes it from one year to the next by seeds. That's the only link to the previous generation. There is no tissues left in the ground that would regrow the next year, like quackgrass or something, or field bindweed. Okay? So monocots, dicots, really, really important. I think most of you, I, I don't have to. Okay? Um, okay. I am, what I'm, although I'm not going to spend much time, I mean, again, not all of you have taken taxonomy. This is just kind of to say, I will try to give you more diagnostic characteristics to help you out. But if you've had some taxonomy, and you know that you can, you know, families, certain families have certain key characteristics. And I'll try to tell you some of those. Um, but that would be helpful if you know that ahead of time. You're just, you'll just it'll be easier for you to, to, to deal with this. So here's the monocots. We, we've spoken about this. They tend to have narrow linear leaves, parallel veins, okay? Um, and so most of you are, are, are pretty familiar. The dicots, the embryo has, has uh, two cotyledons. These are the broadleaf weeds, branch growth, broad leaves. Okay, the, you know, what we would call the typical herbaceous species. Okay, so this information is, is there. Here's an example of a monocot. Okay, the poaceae, this is large crab gas. Digitaria sanguinalis. Okay, it's a, at the seedling stage. This is the one that you saw in the field that's, or even at the garden that's got the digits, you know, it's the inflorescence. If you look at turf right now, and I saw this in my own turf this morning, I saw this tinge of red. And that's what it was. It was crabgrass there, ready to go. If I don't mow it before it goes to seed, I'm going to be in trouble. Okay? And it tends to grow low to the ground. And that's the other thing. Uh, if any of you have worked in turf or even in any you know, mowing areas, these plants adapt themselves. You select for plants that grow prostrate along the ground so that they miss your, um, your, your blade, basically. Uh, and that's a, a good adaptation. I mean, over time, why grow tall if you're going to get wiped out? So you select for it. Okay, so here's a good example of, uh, of a monocot. This is a dicot. Um, some of, I think in yesterday's class, some of us in, in your Stephanie's field, we pulled out some smart weeds. This is called lady's thumb, polygonum persicaria. One of the reasons was that uh, it resembled kind of the, the nail, you know, the thumb. And if, you know, often if somebody can smash it with a hammer, you get this kind of black triangular feel to it. Okay, it is not a good characteristic to separate this specific species, lady's thumb, from any of our other polygonum species. So I'm not going to use that characteristic. Some people say, oh, it's got the black d notch on the leaves. It's lady's thumb. There's going to be another characteristic that I'll show you that's going to be the best character. And it's straightforward. You will do that on, on the practical exam. I'm going to give you some smart weeds and tell me which one is this. And you'll look for this. And it's um, going to be a structure called the ochria along the stem. And it's going to have some spines on it. And I'll, I'll point that out to you. But just Recognize that this, for those of you who might know this plant and said, oh, hey, I knew it because it had that block, many of the other similar species in that genus have that too. So, yeah, you can tell it's a smart weed, but you can't tell what species, and that's sometimes not ideal. Okay, annual, biannual, perennial. Very important to know that. Boy, you know, like I said, you're in a grower's field, and you've got to take out the textbook on a you know, fairly common species in the grower's field to figure out if this thing survives by seed only, or does it survive? It's a biannual or a perennial, and uh, your credibility often is right there on the spot. If a grower sees you now, if it's a rare plant that you haven't really seen before, I think growers and stakeholders understand. And that's happened to me. I don't know what that is. I'm going to have to go back. But if I'm seeing lamb squirters or ragweed, which are common in this area, and I'm there, and the grower is saying, hey, so what do I do? What do you think? You know, what's the biology of this thing? And I'm, oh, excuse me, I'm Got to go in there and, and, oh, let me look it up. And it's the grower saying, hey, this thing is all over the place. How could you not? So in that case, this becomes, that's why I want you guys to be aware of it. Now, some of you might say, why do I have to memorize? I can always look it up. Yeah, but if you're going to be working, you know, this is one of the things in, in this area. You should be able to rattle it off. Maybe not all 80, but at least the key ones. So what is an annual? It's a plant that completes its life cycle from germination to seed production in one, usually I'll say one year, but it's really one growing season. So most of our, and we'll have what are called summer annuals, and we'll talk about that. The summer annuals, so we have annuals. The summer annuals are those that germinate in the spring, okay? They're going to germinate in the spring. They set seed in the summer, fall, and they're dying. The foxtails, and when we were out there, we're starting. They've already set seed. They're going to die. They're summer annuals, okay? They're, these plants, okay, tend to be a major problem in our spring-sown crops. 
So in our corn, our soybeans, they're just perfectly adapted to grow during when our spring sown crops are growing. Okay? They're not very competitive in our winter rye or winter wheat because that's when you know, they sh they're going to be out. They can't handle that kind of a cold season. Okay? Here's the end. Most of our major weeds are in this group, summer annuals. The winter annuals are those that germinate late in the season. We have now are going to have plants that are going to, here's some examples, chickweed, henbit. They're actually germinating now. Okay? The seeds were, were produced in, in May or June. They sat in the ground for a while. Now that the temperatures and light is, photo period is decreasing, that's a cue for them to start germinating. They're going to pass the winter as little green rosettes, little green seedlings under the snow. They're not going to die. And come spring in March, April, as the snow melts, they're the first to come out. Okay? So they're going to be, given that they germinate in the fall, okay, they're going to be a major problem in our fall sown crops. So as we're getting the winter rye, winter wheat in there now, cover crops, they're the ones that are going to be competing. Okay? They're not going to be the lamb squatters. They're not going to be the pigweed or the velvet leaf. They're going to be the chickweed, the uh, um, things like, like the hen bits, okay, are some of these species that we have in here, okay? So do you all, so if I, may, I'm, if I ask you on, on a prelim, in your own words, tell me what's the difference between a summer annual and, and a winter annual, and maybe give me an example of a plant that behaves in that way you'd be able to tell me. Now, let me just tell you, there are going to be some species that can do both, okay? A good example would be something like horseweed, Coniza canadensis, you know, that big, tall, flowering composite. It can go either way, depending on its, you know, some seeds can germinate in the fall. Most of the time it germinates in the spring, but you do have it in the fall. So, but the key here is that these plants survive from one year to the other, no matter what time of year, by seeds. That's it. So if you can control these plants, i.e. don't let them go to seed, you're ahead of the game. You are on top of it, okay? Now, of course, the seed bank might be filled if you get a new piece of land. But say you were to start in a clean field. I mean, you sterilized it. There was nothing there. And you would prevent any of these seeds from getting in there. You would not have any weeds. It doesn't really happen. But so knowing that it's an annual tells me what kind of management I need to do, okay? The other term is a biannual, and please note, okay, biannuals, note the spelling. It is not an A here, it's an E. It's not biannual, just like an annual, it's biannual, it's, it's with an E. Okay, it's a, often, I often see this mistake. These are plants that complete their life cycle during two growing seasons. In our part of the world, we're talking about the first year the plant will develop a rosette, so garlic mustard is a good example for those of you who work in natural areas, okay? Burdock, bull thistle. The first year in the growing season, they're just these big basil leaves, big, you know, can be big, and they're just sitting there. You mow, you go right over them, no problem. They go through a winter, okay? And that is, and then they bolt, they flower. They put out this bolting, this big stem, flowering stem. They set the seeds. And they're dead in the fall. So I, I've seen a lot of, you know, bull thistle now, you know, the, pap, the seeds are floating away, the plant is dying. So it's taken two years. Does anybody know what the correct term is for um, the process where the plant goes through a winter and the cold temperatures stimulate flowering? So cold period that stimulates flowering. What is the term, the correct term that's used botanically or vernalization? Vernalization. Okay? Vernal means winter. Okay? Vernalization is the process where a cold temperature or cold temperature, cold period is required to stimulate flowering. Okay, how many of you guys are in ornamentals, hort, interested in nursery plants and so forth? If you are, you guys do this. We do this all the time with chrysanthemums. You know, you've got to give them, you know, you put them through. It's, it's a light-induced reaction in that case, but it's also some plants will require a cold temperature. So here's, and we've done this in this class in the past. If I go out there now and I grab, uh, let's just say bull thistle, that's in the, in the rosette stage, i.e., this is its first season. 
okay? And I, we take it, we dig it up, we put it in a pot, hopefully it's not going to die, and then we, we put it in a refrigerator for usually a couple of weeks, okay? We take it back out and put it in a, in a greenhouse or a grow chamber with decent light to simulate spring, this thing is going to put out, a, it's going to bolt. We basically have tricked it, you know, to say, hey, you've gone through the winter, come on back, we put it through vernalization, and so if you're there, you know, commercially trying to get these plants to be in flower and so forth, that's what they would do, okay? So that is what these plants go through, what we call biannual. So examples, so the second year they develop a flowering shoot, they bolt, B-O-L-T is the term often used. They bolt, okay, they set seed and they die. Wild parsnip, that poisonous plant we talked about, giant hogweed, okay? Most cases are biannuals. Wild carrot, okay? Now, how many of you guys grow, uh, well, yeah, you grow carrots and stuff. What would happen if you wouldn't harvest your, your carrots this year? So you got, you, you know, you got some carrots in your little vegetable plot, and you couldn't get in there. Will they go through the winter? Yeah, they'll go through. What happens next spring, next year? Bolt. They're going to bolt. Just parsley does that, too. I got some parsley from one year to the other, and I, I just want to get the basil leaves in the early spring before or after it bolts, and you can't use it. These are all biannuals. Okay? We use them as annuals. I mean, we want the carrots, we don't want them to go to bolt and put their energy in seed. We want it to have it in the taproot. That's the commercial, you know, marketable part of the plant. Okay? So, now, one thing you have to understand is that sometimes these plants, okay, depending on the kind of situation they're in, biannuals could become perennials. I.e., it could take three growing seasons to, you know, to produce the seeds and, and, and kind of then die and so forth. So, it's not exact science. It's in general, this is 90% of them will follow this. But if it's under stress or other conditions, been mowed and chopped and, and things like that, it might, okay, stay in the rosette stage longer than one growing season. So just, just be aware of that. But knowing that this plant is a biannual is important. So when I was working with some of the uh, Department of Transportation folks along the uh, throughway, they had some issues with wild parsnip. And one of the things the guys asked me is, should we mow this thing now and being careful about the sap? They had all the gear. I said, yeah, they're in, it's in seed. This plant is now is going to die after this year, but don't let those seeds get back in there. There's enough little rosettes there from previous years. You guys have to start knocking these plants off, okay? Had you not known that the plant is a biennial, I don't know what you would say. Oh, no problem. Just remove the, uh, the seeds, and there's no problem the next year. Unless they're seeing, well, you can see, look on the ground, that these, these rosettes are there, and they can, you can spray those and so forth. Okay? Or if it's a perennial, no, no, it's going to be here year after year. You need to be, to be really cautious. Okay? So, the big group, and so annuals tend to be a problem in our annual cropping systems. The more cultivation we do, the more disturbance there is, the more annuals are the problem. In no-till systems, okay, or where we have reduced tillage, or in natural areas where obviously we're not tilling up the land, perennials become a problem. Turf. There's another. Perennials are a problem in turf, okay? Biannuals and perennials. These plants survive more than two growing seasons. Often it can go 10 years, 20 years, okay? They grow from the same plant or structure year after year. So the dandelion that's in my yard today, if I don't do anything this time and I put a little, you know, tag on it, I go back next year, it's the same plant except it's going to be twice the size, okay? Eventually it might die after four or five years after it produces who knows how many thousands of seeds, but basically, this is a perennial. It's in the same spot. It'll be in the same spot year after year. Okay? Reproduces. So we have two groups of perennials, and this is important. Some of them are called simple herbaceous perennials versus creeping perennials. By far, the more problematic are these guys. They're the creeping. So what are simple herbaceous perennials? These are plants that live for more than two growing seasons. They reproduce naturally only by seed. They prefer to reproduce by seed. However, if something happens to them, you chop them up, and like I go in my yard and I try to pull the, I have this little thing that I can go in there and pull, it grabs the dandelions and pulls them out, but I'm, I leave a quarter you know, inch of the taproot in there, it doesn't get the whole thing, or you go in with a little knife and you try to remove them, or a shovel, they will reproduce from those fragments. In fact, dandelion, if you even have just a quarter of an inch of that, taproot still in the ground, it'll put up new shoots from that same hole. You can actually look. I mean, it's going to be feeble. It won't be this big, but it'll survive. However, it does not prefer that. It doesn't really like to reproduce that way. It really prefers 
production of seeds. What we see, ah, that's why you go those yellow flowers and then you get all these, you know, seeds flying all over the place. So normally does not reproduce vegetatively. It doesn't have rhizomes and they don't, they don't really partake. Examples, dandelion is a great example, okay? The plantains that we saw, they mostly produce from seed. Yeah, if you tear them apart and chop them, they might, okay, sprout vegetatively in curlia, okay? But, but often it's by seed. So if I ask you what's the difference between, you know, a simple herbaceous perennial and a creeping perennial, one of the things you'll say is that the simple herbaceous perennials are plants that survive for more than two years, but pr reproduce primarily or prefer you know, to reproduce by seeds. Okay, and that's important to know. Okay? Whereas the creeping perennials, these are the more problematic in terms of control. And you'll, you know, when we talk about control, that's, you're going to constantly see the, oh man, yeah, they got rhizomes, they got tubers, they got stolons, which are above ground stems. They nor these plants norm also reproduce by seeds, but it's less important then with these vegetative structures, Canada thistle, these are actual creeping roots. They're not actual stems. So remember, uh, stolons, think about strawberries, okay? Those stems that you see that give rise to those little plantlets, the daughter plants, that's an above ground stem. That's referred to as a stolon, S-T-O-L-O-N-S, and we'll cover that in a little more detail, okay? Below ground, like crack grass, those are, that's referred to as a rhizome but it's actually anatomically, it's a stem. For control, you don't have to worry about it. But whereas for Canada thistle, what you're actually seeing below ground, those are roots. And I'll show you one important difference between a root, a true root and a rhizome and why that may be important in some cases. Um, so tubers, yellow nutsedge, okay. Rhizomes, the crabgrass, Johnson grass, and stolons, ground ivy, creeping charlie, okay. You know, how many of you know or don't know what Creeping Charlie or, okay, or ground ivy is. It's in turf. It's got it's in the uh, mint family. It's really tough to control this thing. Little purple flowers in the spring, and it just grows right over your lawn, and you try to pull it out, and it, it basically nodes or puts down roots at each node as it hits the ground, and you try to go. It doesn't nicely go like this, where you can pull the whole thing out. It goes, then the next segment, and it goes, and it just chokes your, your turf. It's bad news. It's got this, you know, Weird smell that not a lot of people like. And then there are bulbs and corms, wild garlic. But these are the key ones, these, these three, rhizomes, tubers, stolons, okay? So creeping perennial. Not only do you have to know, is this a perennial, but is this a creeping perennial? Why is it going to be important? Think about management. And organic growers have to know that, but even our conventional growers have to know that. Why do you think it's, I'm just not going to say, um, who cares? Just know that it's a perennial. Can you think of management, a management situation where I want to know that? And this is happening. It happens all the time. Yes? Kind of like organic growers that will go and cultivate, especially when stuff like crabgrass, and then it explodes again, and they don't understand why. Right. So you have to go and cultivate, but then have it throw up enough dirt so it's a mound that it can't penetrate again the next time. Right. So if you don't know that crabgrass has rhizomes, these underground stems, and, you know, a grower said, oh, I'm just going to chop the heck out of it. I'm going to go in and cultivate and you chop it in pieces and you don't do that again or again, or you don't cover it up with soil to basically, uh, you know, choke it or suppress it, you're going to exacerbate the problem. You're going to have 10 times the number of plantlets, okay? Because they're going to regenerate. Those little, right, they can be like an inch, and you're going to get stuff coming out, okay? So that's important. What about if you're going to use a herbicide for our conventional growers? Why do you think it's important? Well, who cares? If it's an annual or a perennial or a creeping perennial versus a simple well, herbaceous. The biomass is underground that you can't see probably going to all different areas. A grower, if you don't know that this thing has all this underground biomass, you might think, hey, I'll just throw some paraquat. Not that that's a common one that people use. And the paraquat is a herbicide that just kills the top growth. Okay? Um, and you say, oh, that's, I just need to get the top. And, you know, I may get into root a bit, but it's not a, it's not a problem. Well, if you've got three quarters of the biomass, it's below ground, you got this mat of rhizomes, tubers, and stuff. You want a herbicide that what we call systemic, which is you apply it on the leaves or in the ground, and it is transported inside the plant through to areas that are taking in the resources. Okay? So do you know how actually Roundup or glyphosate, the most widely used herbicide right now, gets into the plant? It actually tricks the plant in thinking that it's a carbohydrate, that it's a sugar. It's, it's nutrition. It, it goes into the phloem. And we'll go over that, you know, which is where the nutrients are transported in the plant. 
and goes to wherever the plant needs energy. And, and usually that's in areas that are actively growing. So where is that? At the tip, where the new leaves are being produced, and at the bottom, storing it in the rhizomes and tubers. That's why when you apply Roundup, the first symptoms are visible at the growing tip. We look and say, oh, yeah, it's starting to turn white, yellow, because that's where the herbicide is going. And then, you know, just like if some of you have taken soil fertility courses, you know how if a plant is deficient in a certain element, you know, oh, this is not transported a lot, so we'll see damage in the older leaves first versus, you know, the, the, the earlier leaves. So, so from a management perspective, knowing, you know, this is not just academic, oh, yeah, just know it's, you know, it's nice botanically to know it's a creeping perennial and stuff. Practically, boy, you can't get away with this stuff. If you don't know what you're dealing with, and again, if it's a new weed, you're not familiar, there's no problem. You look it up, but at least know what that means. Perennial, creeping perennial. Oh, I need a herbicide that's going to be moving, not something that just kills the top. You got candid thistle, you're not thinking paraquat or bazagran that's going to sit up at the top. You want something that's going to be easily moved. And we'll cover that, how plants, and plants resist that. You think, oh, you put the stuff on and... No problem, come on in, it's open door. No, plants have resistance to that. No, not the typical reason, but actually will defend themselves against foreign chemicals trying to get in there. And that's why we have to have adjuvants, and you, you put UAN, urea, to get that to get into the plant. And we'll cover all that. But again, trying to make the point how important this is, okay? Do not want to minimize that it's not just all creeping perennials or herbaceous. I just want you to know that we also have aquatic species that are, you know, perennials, you know, water milfoil, water hyacinth, uh, water chestnut. So some of you are working in aquatic areas, recognize those, and we have the, you know, the, uh, what is it called, the American Aquatic Botanical Society, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big group, water management society. You're in Florida, this is big. This is bigger than, than you know, most of my colleagues in Florida are aquatic weed scientists. You know, they're wor working, you know, in, in, in uh, you know, some of the natural parks and so forth, just because, you know, of, of water. And certainly woody perennials. You guys know, you've seen multiflora rose? Isn't that a beautiful plant? Do you know what happened, how that plant got here? Anybody know? I thought they used it for fencing. Who did? I guess that one was. Soil conservation. Uh, that came here, they used it as natural fencing. To keep it. Yeah, but in the 50s and 60s, it was actually given out to growers to plant along their hedgerows to say, hey, no animal's going to go through this baby, you know, and then the next thing you know, this thing's exploded. It's all over my place, all over upstate New York. It's a really bad news plant, okay? It's, it's, it's become an invasive, but it was purposely planted, just like kudzu. I'll show you this, this plaque from Florida that says, how many of you don't know kudzu? Or, you know, don't be afraid of it. A major invasive plant in the south particularly, Okay, it's a vine, it's a legume, it's actually quite nutritious. Uh, but it was planted, uh, you know, initially also as a forage plant, and there's this big plaque in front of this uh, USDA, you know, uh, um, USDA station in Florida that, that says, this is the place where, the, you know, kudzu was released, and, and, you know, to all over to a million acres across the country. You look at this thing now, it's called the weed that ate the south. I mean, literally eats you a lot. I mean, you, you, I've got some pictures. You got, you know, if you haven't seen this, you should see this. It's just a mess, man. You can't get in there. People are thinking about using it as a biofuel. A lot of biomass there. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, people are looking at it as a bio. Man, we're gonna have to remove this invasive plant. Might as well use it. Okay. So again, a lot of, for those of you who are interested in ornamentals, a lot of ornamentals, a lot of invasive plants were brought in through the, uh, you know, nursery ornamental, but are purposely by agronomists. Let's try this. Oh, you're going to try switchgrass. We'll talk more about that. That kind of scares me because you need to be aware about switchgrass and that not, a, every, not all of them are the same. If we've got, you know, uh, 50 million acres of switchgrass across the country, that's something we need to think about. What happens if it doesn't work? How the hell are we going to get rid of it? So it's all things to I me. Mean, it's nice to think biofuel and stuff, but when you're starting to touch, these things are adapted and we've had, we've had issues here. I'll skip this. This is just showing you the basic life cycle of, of an annual, okay, or biannuals, the different life cycles, okay? So an annual completes its life cycle in one growing season. It goes from seed to seed in one growing season. A biannual will spend the first growing season as a rosette, 
second year flowers and then dies, and a perennial obviously can complete the life cycle over many years. It's the same plant over and over again. Okay? So here's a question for you. What category or life habit, life cycle classification, would you consider grapes? It's a perennial. Okay. Um, but we have plants that will produce seed or fruit every year. As soon in their first year, they're going to produce it. They're, you know, some of the, some of the particularly invasive, you know, plants, weeds. But many of our crops don't do that. We need some, some time. You know, grapes, you don't just put your, your cane in the first year, you're going to get grapes coming out. You know, you need three, four years. So you may not have some prunes like the first year. It's just trying to get, you know, get some biomass and stuff. Okay, so very often what I'm getting at is you'll have perennials that will be producing, you know, seeds year after year, or fruits year after year, but we have some that have need an early uh, development period, I mean, period before, just like oak trees, they don't right away in the sapling producing, okay? Um, so they, over multiple generations, but what I wanted to get to is, um, is a situation, do you know of any plant that lives many years? So it's definitely a perennial, from season to season, but flowers only once, sets seeds, and dies. Versus our grapes, you know, our grapes don't die, they, you know, say it takes them three years to become reprodu um, reproductively mature. The, the grape plant doesn't die that year, you know, boom, it's dead. No, I mean, that wouldn't be fun, or your, your apple trees and so forth. But there, is, there are some plants that survive many years, the same plant over and over again, but one time, it bolts, and there's some cues that the plant needs, but just at one time, okay? Right on. So good. How many of you guys know the agave plant, the century plant? It doesn't necessarily survive 100 years, by the way. But I remember being in Arizona, and I was walking by a friend's place, and he said, you know, and I see this big plant. I don't know if you've seen it. There's tremendous flowering stock. It must have been like 15, 20 feet up in the air. I said, what is this? He said, you know what? I've been in this house 35 years, the first time it flowers. And I left, and he said, yep, it died right after, you know, the next day. This was it. The plant had 35 years, okay? So what we, what we call that is, is um, uh, I think we, the term they use is um, a monoecious perennial. So it's a perennial, but survive, you know, flowers once and dies. Most of our weeds that are perennials do not do that. And again, even some of our, our fruit trees, okay? So... That's something to, to think about. Um, how you, one wants to, this is just a little um, idealized life history diagram to just show you the general life cycle of plants. And again, uh, we'll probably go in more detail. If you can think of this as being your, your, your soil, no matter where you are, you've got all these weed seeds in there. And we're focusing on weed seeds, but it could be a forest. And this is called the seed bank or the seed pool, the seed bank. When somebody says, Oh, man, I wonder what your seed bank's like. They're, they're asking, I wonder if you've got a lot of, you know, weed seeds in there or, or if you're looking at rare species. Um, and so what happens is not all of them, does everything in, in the ground in terms of seeds germinate and emerge? No. Remember I told you that these plants, particularly weed seeds, are dormant. Some of them are dormant. They don't all germinate at once. Remember I told you you could be real famous, win a Nobel Prize, if you could figure out how to get all of these, if these were weed seeds, to germinate one time so that then you could clean them out either with mechanical control, herbicides, uh, flame weeding, you name it. Or shut these guys off so that they don't come up at all, and it's just your crop. You figure that out, I t I'm telling you, you're going to have a fast ticket to stardom. Yes? Is there any way to analyze the seed bank pre-emergence? How do they do, like, is there any way you can like, look at broad spectrum, like what you have in the soil oh, yeah. without coming out? Oh, absolutely. We do that all the time. It's a sampling procedure. We used to do it in this class, but it just was so much work, where we actually went out in different fields, organic fields, conventional, uh, guys that had been in, in alfalfa for three years, four years, and we, you go with soil course, just like you would do you know, for the 260 soil science course. You, you go in, we take cores, and we then put them in flats, and we allow things to germinate. And we can also separate, for some of you, and we do that in our lab, and it's very tedious, some of the summer students that have done this, we can separate wheat seeds or any seeds from the soil through this uh, hydraulic water system that we've, we've, we've built. And it all has to do with the density of the seeds. And the seeds will flow to the top. We separate in the soil at the bottom. 
you know, some of the organic matter we remove, and, we can, and then we count. Then we say, oh, and then we can estimate. We estimate how many seeds are there per acre. You know, if we go down, say, six inches, 15 centimeters, okay, which is the standard that's used. So that's where you get an, and then, yeah, we do that all the time. And that's how we test if uh, maybe a weed management tactic we're doing is working. Is we sample before we start the experiment, oh, look how bad this was. And then hopefully after four years, if we're using cover crops or we're using a given herbicide, we sample the same area and compare. Say, wow, we've decreased you know, the seed bank by 80%. Might still be a lot, but 80% you know, works. So this is what's happening here. You have environmental sieve is think about, there's a whole bunch of seeds here, but now you've got a sieve that has specific diameter holes, and depending on your size, some of them will filter through, others are going to stay back. Just think of that, the environmental sieve as being nature, kind of allowing some things to germinate, and so the cues have to be bang on. Otherwise, the, the plants won't germinate. Some of them will, will grow and reproduce vegetatively. They will flower, okay, mature, and then they themselves produce seeds. This is known, and the seeds go back into the seed bank. This is known when the seeds are produced and go back into the, the ground. That is re oft sometimes re referred to as the seed rain. So if somebody says, oh, man, the seed rain this year is going to be bad, that means that a lot of seeds from weeds are flying in, you know, like what Stephanie's field looks like. Obviously, she's planted and is allowing the weeds to grow, but you know that seed bank is just going to be horrendous. There's seeds going in. The seed rain is really heavy. It's really bad, and you can measure that. You can actually put some apparatus that can capture the seeds from these plants and go, wow, you know, 100,000 seeds, 50,000, okay? So this is an idealized, so seed, particularly for annuals, this is kind of important, okay? Uh, they don't typically have vegetative structures, but we'll talk about this. And so the reason I'm showing you this is because when we're going to start talking about managing, okay, it's cool you know this, so what? Where is the weak link in each of these plants? Where should we be doing some management? How can we reduce the seed bank? If, you know, and our conventional guys want to do that too. Don't just say, well, no, they depend on herbicides. They don't care. They do care because that saves them money, okay? And so can we do something about the seed rain? You know, in biological control, can you put something in here that could, you know, basically grab the seeds, you know, a biological agent, an insect or something that can get into the developing seed head of the weed and eat away? And we do a lab, for those of you in the IPM class, we'll do a lab with burdock. And you'll see that there's this moth the larvae of the moth drills holes in the seeds of burdock. It's a natural biocontrol agent. Okay? A lot of, some seeds still make it, but um, that's, that's kind of important. Okay? So we'll, we'll go through this whole, you know, these different aspects. So where can we do stuff? I, um, oh, that reminds me, and, and it's going to bring me up to this other point. For those of you interested in machinery and kind of, you know, something neat. But before I forget, if you have time this afternoon... At 12.20 to 1.10, there's going to be a seminar uh, in 135 Emerson, just down the hall. Uh, and if you come early, around noon or so, there might even be li a light lunch still there. But it's a crop and soil science seminar. But the speaker is, uh, is a weed ecologist from um, the USDA lab. It's called the Weed Management Lab in Urbana, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, so from the Midwest. And he's an expert in looking at developing, looking at biological weed control for these invasive plants. But he's an ecologist. He's not an entomologist. What he's trying to show is what I'm trying to show you here is can we ahead of time know where the insect, if we're going to use an insect, let's say it's an insect, not a pathogen or even a you know, herbicide, should we know where, where should we put all of our energy? Should we go for an insect that attacks the roots? Should we go for an insect that attacks the leaves? Should we go for an insect that attacks the seeds as they're developing? Where is the weak link in this plant? And that's something that the entomologists, the biocontrol people, if they know ahead of time, say, oh, man, the Achilles heel of this plant is, man, if you can get it at the seedling stage, because that transition is very sensitive, you know, that's where you're going to have the most impact. So look for an insect or a pathogen or some control, cultivation, whatever, that goes after these seedlings. And, and so... If you can make it, I think you're going to learn a lot. I mean, some of it might be, you know, some modeling stuff. But if any of you are interested, the implications of that are, you know, important. And we'll cover that in biocontrol. But anyway, so 1220. But, well, I, I was having dinner with this, um, with this faculty member from, from the USDA. And one thing he told me is that uh, out in Illinois, we were talking about seed banks. And, and he said, um, 
And I was talking to him about that, and I said, uh, man, wouldn't it be nice when we're combining, and you know how you know, you've got the combine, it'll get your grains, and then the chaff often can go at the back or it's thrown out. That's where the wheat seeds are flying out, back into your field, okay? With the rest of the, of, of the chaff and, and, and materials, even though you might have a cart or something, which in the Midwest, he said, none of the growers want to do that. They, they want to go through their field fast. I mean, they got you know, thousands of acres. They're not going to be in there with carts. And, but one of the things he's working with some ag engineers on, and John Deere, is um, and, and something that was based on the research he had done. So what he said was that basically if you have wheat seeds and you sandblast them or you, you make little nicks in them, they will die from disease. Diseases will move into these plants within a month if they're nicked or, just, or you know, kind of damaged, which is really kind of neat. And he said, you know, so what we're, they're doing is trying to develop this, this combine or at least a part of the combine that can basically, if you can blast, sandblast these seeds that have been separated from the chaff. There's a, he, the way he mentioned, I'm not an expert in combine. Some of you might know best. But at some point, you do get a bit of a separation of the two. Then they're kind of, the chaff and the wheat seeds meet back up and then are, they're thrown out. But at that point where the wheat seeds are by themselves, if you could have a unit there that kind of just nicks these or blasts them, then you're ahead of the game. Um, then they could get onto the ground. It doesn't matter. They're going to be infected. There's going to be disease. And we'll talk about that, that it's not, even though this is nice that they're in the soil, they're also prone to getting diseases or being eaten by insects. Okay? But that would be cool. That would be taking care of seeds before they even make it onto the ground. So I told him to keep me posted. I, and maybe he's going to talk a bit about that at the seminar. But yes? And when do you see an explosion of common pathogens that could go to your other crops? Well, this is what they're, they, they, have, they have not noticed that, that it's, it, they tend to be not the same ones that, you know, that would attack crops. But that's, that's a valid point. I mean, it's still at the exploratory stage. So the idea being, hey, could you then increase the, you know, Phytophthora or Rhizoctonia, some generalist pathogens that can go after your beans or your corn or your vegetables? But the whole idea is how do we cut, where do we, where's that weak link? And often, if you could get these before they get to the ground, or at least keep them in the ground, then you're, like I said, you're ahead of the game, okay? Um, before I get to this, I just want you to be aware of um, the physiology separation here. I just want you to, just, and if um, this is new to you, it would be nice if you get a chance to just, Go into an introductory plant phys book, okay, in the library. You don't have to have taken the course. If you have, maybe this will come back. But just read the part on what's the difference between a C3, a C4, and a CAM plant, okay? Most plants and weeds tend to be C3s. Does anybody know why it's called C3? What, what is the C3? What, what is it dealing with? What? And but what, what process is this related to? Photosynthesis. So there are plants that will use light energy. Remember, you know, your basic, you know, water, light, oxygen being produced and so on forms a carbohydrate, i.e. the food for the plant. The first compound, intermediate compound, is this C3 compound, okay? And so those plants that carry out that photosynthetic process, they're referred to as C3 plants. Soybeans are C3, ragweed, okay? Many of our crops and weeds are. But we have a certain number of plants that have what's called the C4 pathway. And what those plants do is that the first intermediate or compound that is formed is not a C3. It doesn't have three carbons. It has four carbons. Okay? What else do you know about C4 plants? So what? Okay, one's got three carbons, one's got four. Who cares? And I'll tell you that the examples are these. Some of the crops, maize, corn is in here, pigweeds. Okay, some of our nasty species are here. The crab grasses are here. Okay, so millet, sorghum are all C4s. What is it about them that's important at the basic, most basic level? They're vigorous, they have a higher efficiency of making energy. Yeah, they have a higher efficiency of making, of, of, of making food, you know, energy. They're yes, sir. They, they also are more efficient under warmer, hotter conditions. Okay, that's why corn... It gets warm like these days, it's going full tilt, okay? Um, and this is a rare in, in weeds, at least in our area. The only one that falls in this group is purslane. This is Crassulation acid metabolism. This, this, this plant behaves like it's in the desert. It shuts its stomates where the CO2 comes in, 
during the day because it's too hot, okay? It opens it up at night, allows the COT, and during the day, it, it will go through photosynthesis, okay? Or use up what it's stored during the day, okay? I'm not going to go into too much detail, but do you know what, apart from the efficiency, what anatomically allows C3 and C4 plants to be differ differentiated? Again, if you've taken 241 plant phys and some of the other plant phys, it's probably, yeah, cool. What, what, do you guys know what the difference is? Do you remember something called the Krantz anatomy? I don't want to, you know, I'll leave it at that today because I... Trans anatomy and something called rubisco. Those are the two differences. Uh, Krantz anatomy is basically these very, in C4 plants, they, there are these very thick cells in the mesophyll cells that when oxygen or CO2 is brought in, okay, it doesn't come out very easily, okay? What's, and I'll say a little more about, what's, what's rubisco? Oh, you guys should know Rubisco, man. It's like the most abundant protein in the world. It's an enzyme that does what? So, okay, I know, I know, it's tough. I don't want, I don't want to kill you guys, but let's, let's go easy here. Okay, look, the plant's going to have to take CO2 in the air, okay? Just any plant. It's going to take it, and it has to bring it inside these, these mesophyll cells where, you know, and where you're going to get photosynthesis being produced, okay? The problem is in C3 plants, okay, um, the enzyme that does this, this is the enzyme, okay, that catalyzes this reaction. It takes the CO2, there's water, and brings it to form glucose. Remember, you know, you're trying to, to get sugars. This is the plant, the leaves. This is biomass, okay? This guy here is bad news. Does anybody know what this, this enzyme does that is not very good for C3 plants? Instead of 80% of the times, it's very uh, faithful, faithful. And so this is how I put it to you guys, because you'll remember this. A lot of you, most of you have girlfriends, boyfriends. You should know about that. 80% uh, of the time, your boyfriend, girlfriend is being very good to you, okay, because it's taking up CO2 in the air, because we have oxygen and CO2 out there. 20% 20 20 of the time, it's cheating on you. Bad news, bad news, okay? It takes up oxygen, which is not very good. Oxygen is not helpful here. You need carbon. But 20 so it's kind of uh, unsure, okay? Once it gets in here, so this is an inefficient system, okay? What C4 plants do, okay? So this plant is taking up all this energy, and, st and then the oxygen is brought in by mistake or not, and it's what's at least one of the carbons that's being produced is wasted again, okay? Respiration, it's just a waste, okay? So the C4 plants evolved from C3s, and what they do is they do two things that make them much better, okay, at making sure that oxygen, that there's no cheating going on. The first thing they do is they don't use Rubisco on, on the outside. They use another enzyme called PEP, or phospholenopyrate. Don't worry about it, I won't ask. This thing here is the most faithful enzyme to CO2 that you could find. It's like one of you guys, which are boyfriend, girlfriend. You're it, okay? 100% affinity to CO2. So no matter if O2, you've got other folks flying around, you're the one. They're going to focus on you. That's what this is going to do. The other thing is that it does is once the CO2 gets in here, they've got these very thick cells. These are the C4 plants called the Krantz anatomy, bundle sheet cells that do not let anything out. So the CO2, which is what you need, Okay, is there, and that's a very efficient process. The CO2 is what you want, and that's why C4s do a lot better in hot, warm climates. And that's why things like maize, pigweed, crabgrass are going to do well. Okay, so I'll leave you with this quick question then. Hey, you all know about climate change. It's coming. It's here. It's here. Based on what you're hearing about CO2 levels increasing, who is going to be favored? in 20 years time? C3, C4s, or CAM? C3, why? There's more CO2. The chances are that there's going to be more. You flood this place. The reason C4s evolved is that the concentration of CO2 started to decrease in the atmosphere. There was a peak, then it decreased, they came in, but now we're pumping all those fossil fuels back, CO2 is going up. And so the thought is that some of these, and a lot of our bad species are in here as well, 
But again, it's not just CO2 that's going up. We've got temperature, we've got a lot of other issues, okay? So I'll continue. Next class, we're gonna get into some, some uh, models and, and plant strategies. Um, I think Kathy,